<clears throat> so, uh, welcome everybody. I will tell you a small contribution to a <clears throat> famous problem. Uh, <clears throat> which is sometimes called the <clears throat> inverse Goldbach problem of Ostmann. At least this is how Christian Elshoff calls it. I don't know whether it is his invention or not. So uh, this is about representing the set of primes as a sum set. It is easy to see that the complete set of prime cannot be a sum set in any non-trivial way. But maybe if we uh, add or delete a few, then we can. This is still unsolved. Everybody expects a negative answer, including me. But it is known that if such a decomposition existed, then both A and B should have about square root x element up to x, which is <coughs> achieved by uh, some version of large sieve and also as Holtz has an explanation why we cannot hope a complete solution in this way. Now what I'm going to tell you is that the situation uh, changes if we allow, <coughs> allow negative primes. So this is the following. We will assume a hypothesis which is uh, expected to be <clears throat> true and soon I will uh, remind you what it is. So if we assume the prime top hypothesis, then there are infinite sets A and B such that the sum set is the set of positive and negative primes, including plus minus two and excluding plus minus two and plus minus three. It is easy to say that they must be excluded. And uh, I will uh, tell you a proof of a slightly weaker version when we exclude a finite number of primes. Uh, just not to, I don't want to tell about the extra trouble we have to take to include the small primes. And also, instead of a sum set, I will use a different set. Of course, we can change b into minus b, which will make for a somewhat more comfortable notation. So uh, this is the result. I will, whose proof I will tell you, assuming the prime number hypothesis, there are infinite sets of positive integers such that the differences are, all differences are primes and only a finite number of primes is missing. Now the prime top hypothesis means that in a, any Conf linear configuration, you will find primes unless there is a congruence reason to exclude it. So if we have a finite collection of uh, linear forms AI times X plus BI, then we can then find an infinity of values of X such that they are all primes, except if there is a fixed prime P with the property that for all x, uh, one of those forms must be a multiple of P. <clears throat> now the simplest and still unsolved case is the wind prime conjecture. Nobody doubts that this conjecture should be true. Uh, I will use a corollary written in a somewhat different forms. We want to prime find numbers x in a given congruence class modulo some number q such that a finite number of translates are all primes. And the condition is the following for divisors of q uh, 
uh, <clears throat> the zero class modulo p should be missing and for primes not dividing q at least some residue class should be missing and uh, the plan is very simple and naive we have a finite uh, collection of numbers such that the differences are primes we take a prime which is not represented and try to represent it by <coughs> extending the sets so our prime is r we want to include a set a number x to a and x minus r into b so that their difference should be r now uh, under the previous assumption this can be done if the union of b and the union of a translation of a by r does not form a complete system of residues modulo any prime now the life is not that simple because if we exclude this x and x minus r then it can happen that in the next step this uh, condition is <coughs> void for some other prime or there is a trap that will kill the process after 10 steps and uh, we must take care to avoid this and what we will do is that we will impose restrictions of on our sets a and b modulo quite a lot of primes <clears throat> now we cannot uh, fix them in infinite for infinitely many primes at the starts because then there may be no integer that satisfies all those conditions what we will do is that we import some initial conditions and then as we proceed we invent new and new conditions while keeping all the numbers which are already in our set so we <coughs> list all the primes we want to represent that is all the signed primes in a sequence with <coughs> increasing order of absolute value and uh, our plan is to find sequences a1 a2 and b1 b2 such that a sub i minus b sub i is exactly the r i prime r sub i <coughs> so what in step n we will have the first n elements in each set a and b that is we are representing the first n primes and we will have also a set of restrictions u sub p v sub p of residues modulo p for every primes which is less than the next than the first prime not yet represented so that uh, all residues of a are in u sub p or residues of v are v sub p and here is the condition we need that uh, <clears throat> the elements of u which are not in v and the elements of v which are not in u should have the property that their differences contain every non-zero residue modulo of p 
so in the first step, we take R1, the first prime to be represented, we put it into A, we put a zero into B, and for the first, and the first, and the primes for up to K, you know, we will represent primes bigger than K, so the assumption that P is less than the uh, next R is exactly the, the same that P is at most K. We put every non-zero residue into U sub B and only the zero in U. In my screen, somehow there is a mysterious pink line, which I don't know how got there. So now this is the real plan. And if we have somehow n minus one terms, we want to need the nth, we want to construct the nth term. So we want to find the numbers a sub n and b sub n, and also we want to find the restrictions u sub p and v sub p for primes between r sub n and r sub n plus one, which means either one or zero prime. So we want to put some x into A and x minus R sub n into B. And so this represents R sub 1 and all the other new differences should also be primes. X, the new x minus the old B and x minus r sub n minus the old a. They all must be primes. So first, uh, we try to find residues of x modulo the small primes. And uh, here is the <coughs> assumption on the previous slide comes into the picture since R sub n is not zero modulo p, uh, there are elements, an element of u missing from v and an element v of missing from u whose difference is R sub n. And we impose this <coughs> condition on x. And we will see why this is useful. <clears throat> uh, so, to uh, apply the prime tuple hypothesis, we have to check two kind of assumption for primes uh, dividing this Q, which will be the product of all small, small primes. That is a condition for all so small primes. And there will be a different condition for big primes. For small primes, we need that this congruence uh, does not spoil the possibility of the numbers being a prime. That is the condition does not turn any of the difference into zero modulo p. And uh, here is how this condition is used. U small u sub p is in is not in V sub P, but the B's are in V sub P. That's the way we 
constructed them before and exactly the same argument with different letters from for the other number. <clears throat> now, for big primes, we don't have a condition. We need that the numbers that we want to turn into primes do not form a complete system of residues. Now, the number of primes, the number of elements which should not form a complete system of residues is 2n minus 2. They are the previous a and previous b translated by something. So this is 2n minus 2 number, and they cannot form a complete system of residues module any prime which is bigger than that. <clears throat> so uh, we will need that the next absolute value of the next prime r sub n, which is the dividing line between small and big primes is at least 2n minus 2. Uh, soon we will need a bigger bound. Now, so uh, in this way, we find our new elements a sub n and b sub n, and we need, or in some cases we don't need, but sometimes we need a new uh, sets of restrictions, u sub p and v sub p. And uh, here comes the only small trick in my proof. So we cannot construct them arbitrarily because we already have n numbers which are in u and n numbers which are in v. And we can add as many as we wish, but need to be careful. So there are two n residues which are already disposed of, and there are p minus two n uh, for us to play with. And what we do is that for each residue, we toss a coin, and according to result, we put it into up or into VP, definitely not into both. And uh, if we are lucky, these new elements uh, will <coughs> uh, force the condition we need. That is, we get every element, every non-zero residue model of P as a difference from an element of u which is not in v and an element of v which is not in u. So take a fixed z and try to see the chances that it is represented. <clears throat> so take these pairs which differ by z, z two z and c z four z. If the <clears throat> first is in u and the second is in v, then we are happy. Uh, <clears throat> this is a collection of p minus one over two pairs. If there may be two n of them. Uh, which escape our random choice because they are already in A or B. Uh, we did not list all possible pairs which 
whose difference is z. So from z to z, we jumped into c z four z and missed the pair two z three z. This is to make those events independent. So if we have a pair like that whose difference is z, then if the first element comes into u whose probability is a half and the second comes into v whose probability is also a half, then there is a quarter probability that we get z as a difference. <clears throat> there is three-fourths probability that it is uh, does not represent z. And so the probability that uh, none of those pairs gives us the desire, the difference z is three-fourths to the number of pairs to p minus one over two minus two twice n. Now, <clears throat> if this probability is less than one over p, then those events do not cover the complete probability space. There something will be out and uh, there is a choice that works for all z. We don't want a majority of them work only one. So this is a condition, three fourths to the number of pairs should be less than one over p. And if we rearrange this, we get that <coughs> uh, p minus one over two minus two n is bigger than constant times logarithm of p, which is p should be somewhat bigger than four times n, basically four times n plus a constant times log n. Imre, sorry, please excuse me to interrupt. Dan Abramovich has a question. Dan, would you please unmute and ask yourself? Sorry? Um, uh, there is a uh, question. Just a question. Uh, did you say that the events are independent? Is that uh, require, uh, part of the argument? Uh, and if so, why? Uh, we could calculate the probability if they are not independent, just we don't need it. It is simpler to take only half of the possible elements which are independent so that the uh, probability calculation will be uh, easy. <clears throat> Those elements are independent because all because we disposed all those pairs independently. Uh, no choice, no, <clears throat> no incidence of the coin tossing uh, affects two of those uh, of those events. They are independent. Thank you, Imre. Uh, did it help? Dan, are you uh, happy with the answer? Is it, is it okay? I'll have to think about it, but okay. Uh, so maybe I can continue. Yes, please continue, Imre. So this is an equality that has to be held from for primes uh, which are at least as big as R sub n. Now, if it holds for one number, it will hold for bigger numbers as well. So R sub n should be bigger than four n plus one plus a constant times log n, which certainly happens if R of n is at least five times n, 
and n is bigger than some easily calculated bound. Now R sub n, in, we see that we, our list, half of our list is positive primes and half of them is negative primes. So R sub n, value of R sub n is the same as an, the <clears throat> n over two so number of positive primes. That is, it is asymptotically n over two times log n. So it is will be bigger than any constant times n up after a certain limit. And uh, we choose the bound k so that it holds for numbers up to this limit. And, uh, and this ends the proof. And uh, this was the only proof I wanted to tell, but I am going to tell you a few uh, questions and then some observation about a similar problem for square free numbers instead of time of primes. So the first problem is that the set of signed primes is a triple sum set. And my conjecture is that it is, and it would be interesting because we know again by a result of else faults that the positive primes definitely are not a triple sum set. Now I try to modify the previous proof to involve three or a thousand summons, and I have a plan how to do it, but so far I could not, could not work out the details. And the main difficulty is that <clears throat> this simple choice of residues must be replaced by a rather more complicated choice of residues. We needed two sets, U and V, in our previous proof, with the property that both have quite a big number of elements which are not in the other, so that the different set of uh, elements which are unique to one of those sets represents every non-zero. And for three sets, the condition becomes more involved. We need, we don't just need that the set U minus V and W should be big. We need that U should have a lot elements outside the sum set of V and W. Actually, actually <clears throat> outside the negative of those sums and similarly V and W and those three sets of remaining elements after excluding the sum of the two other sets should have the property that their sum includes every non-zero residue. And Since uh, in the step we construct this, we already have some elements of A, B, and C. We need sets with this property and uh, including a number of prescribed elements. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated problem in uh, combinatorial number theory, which I could not yet completely solve. <clears throat> now, here are two not closely related problems which are fun, I guess. One is to 
prove without using any unsolved hypothesis the existence of two sets A and B such that no element of A plus B is divisible by any prime congruent to one modulo of four. And uh, in this, that if we want to residue, exclude the residue class three modulo of four, then we have an easy example, namely the set of sum of two squares, uh, more or less already misses uh, three modulo of four, except then both A and B have such a factor. And we can avoid this if uh, for A and B we only use primes uh, congruent to one modulo of four. So not only there are such sets, but the, there are quite dense such sets. Uh, and um, I think this observation is also due to as Holtz. Definitely it is mentioned in one of his papers. Uh, similarly, the other uh, problem is more or less due to him. The question is that the set of sums of two squares, which is a sum set by definition, is a triple sunset or not? Um, and in the next some minutes, I will tell you a few words about the analogous story of square free numbers. So square free numbers are a sort of toy model for primes. And uh, here is the first problem, whether it is a set of square free numbers is a sum, sum set or not. And here comes the complete analog of the Osman problem, whether the uh, set of square free numbers, excluding some and including a finite number of more, is a sum set or not. Now for the first, I conjecture it is not a sum set, and I think it probably can be proved by a finite argument. <clears throat> so uh, I have established some properties of possibly sets A and B, and uh, if uh, I one could show that no such sets exist of the first thousand numbers, then this would uh, give a solution to this problem. I tried to play with the first few integers and they did not uh, give a complete answer to this. Now, so the, the next problem is about a finite number of exception. And if we allowed uh, more exceptions, but still density zero, then uh, the situation changes somewhat. So this is a result, a quite easy one, that we can find infinite sets A and B, such that the sum set contains all square free numbers and uh, the extra numbers, that is the non-sphere free elements of the sum set, have density zero. So set of square free numbers can be approximated quite well by a sum set from the outside. Uh, I could not decide whether it can be approximated by a sum set from inside. That is that there are sets A and B whose sum is contained in S and the uh, LM and the square free numbers not represented have density zero. My feeling is that the answer should be positive. 
and this is somewhat supported by the following results. There are infinite sets A and B such that A has positive density, even a density which is only a little less than the density of all sphere numbers, such that uh, the sum set contains only square numbers. Uh, easy but not completely obvious. Uh, so this is about positive square fee numbers. And uh, if we take signed square fee numbers, then again, the situation will be different. Because for this set, positive and negative square fee numbers, I can positively solve the possibility of representation by a sum set. Not only three, but as many as you want. There are infinite sets, K infinite sets whose sum set is exactly the set of positive and negative square fee numbers. And in the next version, there are only two sets, but they are identical. So there is a set A whose sum set with itself is exactly the set of even positive and negative square free numbers. We need even, again, by looking at residues modulo four, uh, one sees that uh, odd square free numbers must be excluded. And the reason why the square free phase is easy is twofold. The first is that we don't need any unsolved hypothesis. So instead of the prime tuple hypothesis, we have the square free tuple theorem. If we have a finite collection of linear forms, then there is a value of x for which all are square free, except if there is a divisibility reason to exclude it. Uh, I don't know whose result is it. Uh, the similar statement is known for, not only for linear, but quadratic and cubic polynomials. For quadratic, it is still quite easy. For cubic is difficult. Uh, I don't remember whose theorem is it. And the second reason is that to get square fee numbers, we omit all multiples of prime squares, while for primes, we omit multiples of P, except P itself, which we retain. And for a a similar argument of consisting constraints of residues model of prime squares. The manipulations will be a lot easier. And uh, so this is all I wanted to Tell thanks for the attention. If and uh, now I'm here to listen quest to questions, or you can write questions and comments to my email address. Thank you so much, Imre. For